Should we get going? Great. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see everyone today. We want to welcome you to the Stagwell Media Network um, session on the future of media um, under the microscope. And we're super excited and really honored to have Sarah Fisher here with us today from Axio. She's going to be hosting and moderating a discussion between Brendan and myself um, we're going to be talking about all things Web 3.0, mostly focused probably on the metaverse, just because it's such a meaty topic. Um, but before we do that, I think it would be great to do just a round of intros, and then um, I'm going to hand it to Sarah to maybe say a, a couple of words, and then and then I'll probably get into to talking about the metaverse and just sort of setting up what we'll be talking about today. Thank you so much, Shannon. This has been such a great opportunity to connect with you all uh, a bit virtually. But I was just joking before with Shannon and Brendan that I'm really lucky to even be speaking with you guys virtually because there's been so many shifting plans around CES. So thank you for, for making this happen. I think when we talk about the metaverse and we talk about what's new in the future, there's a lot of questions about how real is this? You know, we can't physically hold on to this right now. We know there's a lot of players involved. I'm actually coming to you live from CES, and this is the big question at CES right now. Are all of these efforts ever going to come together to create one joint digital universe? So it's top of mind here. It's top of mind for me as a reporter. And I know it's top of mind for both Shannon and Brendan. So uh, with that said, I thought we could just sort of jump into the conversation. Um, Brendan, I'd love to throw the first question to you. And my question is, Metaverse has become this sort of like hype word that everyone's putting out there, but no one really knows what it is. Do you think we're going to move from it being a hype word to a real thing in the near future or long term? Well, I think, first of all, we need to we need to say what what does a real thing even mean? Um, but I think that the answer is yes. I think that, you know, the, the hype is out there. And the reason it's a hype word is because people are excited. People are excited about what the metaverse is, what it could mean for, for our future, for us specifically, for the future of brands. It's a new place where we can be engaging with our consumers. We can meet them there. Um, and so I think absolutely, this is, this is a short-term thing. This is happening. Uh, it's going to keep happening. It's going to evolve, um, but, but it's coming. And okay, just to push back on that, in terms of it's coming, how do you define the metaverse? How do you define it? I don't know, Shannon, do you wanna, you wanna take that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's, you know, I've been working in content for 20 years, right? And so as has Brendan <laughs> together on shared clients in some cases, you know, the first step is sort of to define what we're talking about, right? So, you know, when we talk about the metaverse, really it, you know, the way to think about it is not a place, it's not a destination. And as web 2.0 sort of Gen X, you know, Gen Y, right? We think very linearly about, about the, how the world works, right? We, we go on the internet, we go, you know, we go to a website, we go into a place, we get our information, that stuff gets fed back to us on our phone, but it's all very, you know, quid pro quo. Like I understand what's happening. In the metaverse, if you have an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old, like I do, you have the luxury of better understanding what the metaverse is. It is a three-dimensional experience where people can come together concurrently with no, uh, no um, hard stop on the number of users that can be on the platform. And we all can interact together in this three-dimensional environment um, at the same time in these different worlds. And right now, Sarah, to your point, they're siloed. So you have worlds like the ones that we're probably most familiar with look like Roblox 
or Fortnite, right? And and these and it's mostly in the gaming space. But what you're seeing is also brands. You know, Bloomberg Intelligence said that this marketplace could look like 800 billion dollars by 2024. That's mm -hmm. a real thing, and half of that is likely to be gaming, right? So when you think about that, and then all the brands, you know, all the brands you're seeing participate in this space are coming mostly into these gaming worlds, except for brands like Facebook, which announced Mesh right, which is a digital meeting space. So we're all going to come as our digital avatars into the digital world and have a meeting. And then likely what Mark Zuckerberg is envisioning, which looks like Meta, which is where we will be Sim 7.0. And, you know, I'll have coffee with Brendan while he's walking his dog. And then we're going to go to the office and we're going to have a meeting as our avatars in a meeting room, right? Like that is, that is the metaverse. And we can all do that at the same time. It will be a shared virtual experience very, very different than what we understand now. Okay, so I want to follow up with both of you on this. What is the role for brands in the metaverse? Because I'm starting to see them tip their, you know, uh, dip their toes in it. But some of these integrations just feel awkward. You know, United says it's building like a metaverse virtual plane. Do I need a virtual plane? I don't know. So what do you think? Brent, let's start with you. Brent, go first. Sure. I mean, I think that the, the role of brands, um, as in some ways has always been, is, is really to, to create culture, to help pioneer what could be coming within this space. And so do you need a virtual plane? Probably not right now. Do you need a virtual house? Probably not right now. But when you start to think about it, these are things that in the future you might actually say, well, yes, actually, I do want a virtual house because that it's going to become a thing where I want to invite my friends to my virtual house for a cocktail party, for coffee. It's a place that I want to be able to display the art, the digital art that, I, that is becoming so huge out there right now. So I think the role for brands is really to pioneer in the space and help everyone figure out what is the art of the possible um, and, and, and to provide these, these interesting links for consumers um, to actually figure out how do I get into this space? You know, I think that's one of the big things you look at, look at Pepsi when they, when they um, dropped their NFT. You know, one of the big things was what is an NFT? How do I actually participate in this? And so there had to be a step-to-step -step gu step -step guide that was like, hey, how do I even do this? And that's gonna be the role of brands, I think in the short term of really bringing people in and educating the public and getting people into a space that is new, that is different, that a lot of people don't understand and don't know. So, okay, here's a question though. A lot of times when there's new technologies, you'll see brands start to experiment, but there's a lot of opportunities for gaps. If you don't know the space really well, you could actually be making your company vulnerable. What does that balance look like between experimenting in the metaverse, but also not embarrassing yourself with some sort of you know cheeky campaign that looks like you're just trying to get in on the new trend? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's lots of ways into the metaverse. I think also the way to think about the metaverse most broadly as marketers is that we're talking about all things that are technology that we're sort of not, that is not completely developed yet. So you could lump in things like AR and VR. So you think about Snap, right? Snap has 500 million average daily users logging in and using their lenses. You know, that is a version of the metaverse of, the metaverse of Web.3.0 that will be tied into things like NFTs, right? All of these things are like test and learn their way in, but I think there's a couple key components, right? If you're gonna participate in the, in the metaverse, right? If you're gonna have, if you're gonna show up and you wanna have an activation of some kind, whether you're creating it or you're co-creating it with an existing platform, you know, you need to understand what, why are you doing that, right? Like just having a, you know, I'm sure the United executives have a great reason for why they're building a, you know, a plane. And it's probably to complement the fact that like, we want to travel, we want to have experiences, right? This, this notion of community is really important in the metaverse. And so how are you facilitating that interaction? Also the metaverse and NFTs and things like that are being highly used for loyalty, right? How do you keep people engaged and start to create that community? And as we stare down the, the, you know, the barrel of a cookie-less world, as we all know, direct-to-consumer relationships are going to become even more important. Right. So there's a number of business reasons of like why it makes sense, but like understanding what is your what are your objectives? What is your role? Like what's your utility? And then how are you facilitating either community? Or are you how are you tracking and measuring your way in? So whether it's a snap AR lens 
or it's a Roblox integration or a Fortnite integration, or it's something entirely that you're trying to build on your own. Let's, I want to pivot to something that you just mentioned, which is Fortnite. Obviously, you were saying up top, gaming is like a massive part of the metaverse. Yes. What do you think that looks like? Is it that we're all, every company is a gaming company? Is it that, you know, people are just incorporating games into everyday functions like transactions and payments and social media? How should we be thinking about it? I mean, I'll go first, Brennan, if you don't mind. And then, because right. I've, I've been thinking about this a lot. <laughs> like, I think this space is fascinating. And I do think we're going to start to see so many offshoots of what it looks like. So think about what we do on the day to day. It won't make sense for every brand in the world to be part of the metaverse and like, you know, try to do something right. But there are companies. So think about what Netflix is today, right? Netflix is a company. It started out where you got your, your DVDs in the mail. Right. And then we streamed and now we're like in the great streaming war, but now they've announced they're moving into gaming. Right. And they're also doing interactive content with the likes of, you know, Balderslash and, and, and Rare Grills. Right. And so when you start to think about how some of these things are converging, it's not so far apart. They're producing a ton of original content right now. So they're not just licensing from other studios. There's a world where you could see Netflix building a metaverse. Right. There's, if you future cast a little, so you have to work a little bit harder, but you think about brands like Lego and Hasbro and, you know, they have incredible libraries of content and IP. They can start to look to build their own metaverses. So it can be actually product content led, right? It doesn't have to be gaming led, but certainly gaming is a very easy way in. And it's also a very easy way for brands to participate like NBA 2K, right? American Eagle just launched a pop-up shop inside of NBA 2K. Like kids are going in and buying their clothes, right? And, and in the ideal world, like you said at first, Sarah, which is ideally I'll be able to buy my legend, you know, Air Jordans inside of Fortnite, but wear them into NBA 2K on my digital avatar skin. That's the grand plan, right? But we're not there yet. So right now I'm just shopping for my American Eagle, Eagle stuff inside of NBA 2K. And by me, I mean my children with my money. <laughs> <laughs> well, my actual currency that they only know is digital currency, which is a whole nother conversation. <laughs> okay, Brendan, I want to get your talk, your thoughts on gaming, but then I also have a follow-up question for you. So let me hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with, with everything that, that Shannon said. I think that gaming is going to be for some brands, the way that they that they get into this space, they're going to create games for their brands. But I, I think that more brands you're going to see showing up in the different metaverses. You're going to see them showing up in Fortnite, like Shannon mentioned, you're going to see them showing up within other games in the same way that they might show up in the real world. You know, there's plenty of brands that are activating at NBA games in, in the real world. Um, and so they're just transferring that activation to the metaverse in whatever NBA happens to be doing there or whatever XYZ uh, different, different property is doing there within the gaming. So I, I think you're going to see brands activating um, in the metaverse in many different ways, not just through gaming. The thing that I'm noticing recently is I feel like the world is going through this weird sense of digital detox. Like we were so hooked to our devices in the pandemic, but that now streaming subscriptions have sort of tapered off as so we've hit a point of saturation. You're starting to hear about people putting screen limits on their phone, stepping away from social media because it's too much. So with the metaverse, how do we square the fact that this is an ultra digital world. Everything that you would have done, including flying a plane, is now virtual with this tension of the fact that we feel like our lives are overly digital right now. Shannon, uh, let me start with you and then I'm gonna come to Brendan. Okay, um, it's a great question. Um, and honestly, I think it's a generational question. I think that, you know, especially what, what actually the pandemic did for kids is it made them even more digital right? Where they found their communities. When they couldn't go to school, they found their communities in the metaverse, right? So our greatest job and challenge as parents right now is trying to keep our kids off the screens all the time because that's where they want to be. They want to be playing Fortnite and Apex and Roblox and, you know, Animal Crossing and like all these games with their friends. And that is how they're communicating. That is actually, you know, one of the big parts of the metaverse, which we haven't like completely tapped into, but 
you know, and, and where brands can find their way a little bit is in self-expression, right? It is a way they can express themselves and show up in how they see themselves versus how the world would define them, right? And so I do think like it's very, um, it is not for us, right? There, it's actually, so there was an Ipsos study that interestingly said, like, would you be willing to interact? You know, it was, you know, eight, but it started at 18, obviously, because we can't track children, but it started at 18 and it basically eight, you know, I think it was um, 23% of 18 to 36, 18 to 24 year olds said that they would buy um, a product uh, on a scale of one to five, they were very likely to buy a product that they saw in the metaverse, right? Um, it was 14% for the uh, 34 year olds and 34 to 44 year olds, right? So it's a very, like, you'll start to see like people will be willing to interact, then they'll be willing to buy, but we will be led by, our, we will be led by our children. It's sort of the same way that we all got, you know, many of us got into streaming because our kids never watched network television. You know, they, they, did, they went to YouTube or Netflix and discovered content and then made by, by all the princess stuff. <laughs> Can you just clarify? So for that percentage of people that they see something in the metaverse and then they buy it, you're saying they see something in the metaverse, but then they buy it in real life or they see yeah. something in the metaverse. Okay. That makes sense. So you're saying almost that there's going to be like a link between the virtual world and the physical world. Yeah, we should expect. Okay. And that's what the metaverse is, right? So when you look at that, gener that's what I'm saying. It's generational, right? They live in a seamless world where all the things just blend together. Everything from currency, right? So think about the, think about the impact on currency, right? My kids talk in Robux and V-Bucks. They don't, I hand them a $20 bill, they go to the movies. The movies, people won't take the $20 bill anymore because it's contactless, right? Um, so they're, and then they come home and they're like, mommy, we want to buy a digital skin because Ariana Grande is doing a concert in Fortnite. Well, how much does that cost? They're like, it costs, you know, 2000 V bucks. I'm like, how much is that? I don't know, right? Uh -huh. So when you, when it's, it is a, I think it will be a generational thing and people with kids will end up, Kind of getting on the bus a little faster right and then ultimately we will start to have these moments whether it's through snap whether it's through you know uh some there are older gamers obviously playing fortnite whether it's through mesh where you finally have you know you're sitting at a you know round table with your avatar having a meeting <laughs> because you're on microsoft teams okay so brendan my question to you is obviously you know, to Shannon's point, this is a generational thing. The younger generation is more, you know, open and willing to experiment with this. And that's going to impact the way that older generations experiment. But do you think there's a world, going back to the digital detox question, where younger generations are overexposing themselves online? Are we ready to handle the fact that they are doing their entire lives, that they're transacting, virtu transacting virtual money, but don't even know what it means? I mean, I think I think the answer is yes. I think that that you know everyone probably is overexposed digitally online, doing way too much online right now. Um, I think that's actually an opportunity though, because right now we're we're constricted with the things that we have right now that we can use online. So, for instance, in my day, I spend most of my day on Zooms with colleagues, looking at a screen similar to this. With metaverse, we can actually change the way that we will be interacting with colleagues via the digital channels, which may actually make our lives easier. Um, and so I think that there's, there's a lot of things that, again, as the metaverse evolves, as it becomes different, we're going to be able to change the way in which we conduct business, change the way in which we interact with our digital devices or interact with people through the digital world uh, in, in order to um, do business, to live our lives, so on and so forth. Now, I think that there's, there's absolutely going to be the moments where we're going to have to sit there and say, okay, what's the balance? Like there's going to have to be balance of sitting there saying, as, as parents, we need to get our kids outside to play. They need to go out and move. Um, you know, and I think that there's a lot of brands in the space also that are going to have to make sure that they're having that balance too of, of making sure that people aren't just glued to a device in their metaverse day in and day out, 
Um, and that's going to be, there's going to need to be some responsibility with brands to help make sure that they're uh, in making, making it so that parents can get their kids out to do that and reminding, reminding all of us that this is the metaverse, this is a virtual world, there's a whole real world out there too. I, think I love the responsibility of brands point. Shannon, I'm going to come to you in a second. Just in that you're seeing this in web 2.0. There's a lot of pressure on brands to not fund sites with misinformation, you know, to be accountable for where their ad dollars are spent, et cetera. Shannon, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'd love to no, hear your thoughts. Please. I, I mean, I was just um, at kind of an example of that, right? Is so Nike created Nike land, which is their own new metaverse, right? Um, you get... Like, so, you know, their, their, their positioning is that if you have a body, you're an athlete, right? So the, the interesting part of what, about what they've done, right, is that they, you know, have connected back a point system, essentially. So if your mobile device is connected, you get points inside the metaverse for your moving around in the real world. Um, and, you know, then you can use those points for unlocking apparel or, you know, like all that kind of stuff, right? So... I think to that end, and and listen, it is the responsibility of brands. It is the responsibility of parents. You know, it is literally probably my greatest challenge as a parent right now, which is to like prevent screen zombies, right? Which is my kid walking around from the house, like trying to find a different screen to get on to interact with some version of AI and or, you know, gaming and sometimes interacting with a friend and sometimes singing Alexa is their friend, you know, like, those are the those are I think this is this will be the hardest part for parents coming behind, you know, parents like me. Um, but also as we go into a generation of people who, you know, have to learn how to have social courtesy. And I listen to my children on playing Fortnite and I cut them off sometimes. I'm like, you're done, you can't play anymore because they're yelling at their friends. Right. Mm -hmm. So it is an it is it will be one of the greater challenges that we have both in how we participate responsibly as marketers, but also how we manage our families and the growth and like the the, the nurturing of our children and the generations after us. Totally. We have a few minutes left in this conversation before we open it up to Q&A through the chat system. So I just wanted to flag to everyone, start thinking about any questions that you have for Brendan and Shannon, and I'll ask, I'll ask them to them in a few minutes. Um, let's pivot for a second. There's a company that's name now is Meta. Facebook changed its name. That was a huge signal that they wanted to be a leader in the metaverse. Uh, my question to you, though, is who do you think is going to really be the leader? I mean, you have NVIDIA and Microsoft and Epic Games. You have Snapchat. You have every single company that's trying to be the leader in this arbitrary thing. Who do you think is poised to lead? Brendan, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, if you just look at what the company formerly known as Facebook uh, has, has done uh, in really revolutionizing the social, the social media space, um, I do think that there's probably a really good bet to say that they are going to be the leaders, at least for now, um, in, in creating the metaverse. Um, but I think that what's going to happen is you're going to start to, to get a lot of other smaller groups that are going to be doing things. They're going to be pioneering specific things in, in there. And so the question is, is meta going to gobble all of them up and, and add them to their, their metaverse? Uh, or are some of those going to go and create something else and have this wave? Um, so I think for me, the the short term uh, is meta, um, and and the longer term is a bit of an unknown. Okay, but a quick pushback for you, Brendan, is meta is under so much scrutiny right now, yeah. including you know scrutiny around antitrust and acquisitions. If the FTC and the forty eight states attorneys generals. Uh, that are suing Facebook settle with it, part of that settlement might be that they have to have every acquisition above $10 million reviewed by all of those players. So do you think they're actually going to be able to scoop up every single little, you know, metaverse VR, AR company? Or do you think that another company with less regulatory scrutiny is better positioned to do that? Yeah, Sarah, I think it's a, I think it's a good push. Um, you know, I, I, I think that they are probably going to be able to scoop up some of them, whether that's through Meta as the larger company or subsidiaries or whatnot. 
Um, but I think it's a good push. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I, I still think my bet is, is on them just by the nature of what they've done so far. Okay, so I want to pivot to Shannon. Obviously, we know Meta is a leader here. Who else is really interesting that you're eyeing? I mean, I think looking at, I think actually this Netflix thing is super interesting, right? Like it is a longer term play, but I think it's very interesting. I think they will look to change the entertainment landscape in the way that they have previously. Um, but I think in the long term, right? I mean, I agree with Brendan. I think that, you know, Meta has been making inroads and they have a, a vast amount of ways for you to engage on the platform, which means they can rapidly iterate those things. So marketplace, for example, they can iterate, they're developing a currency, right? Which came out, right? So I think there's, I think they're probably best poised and then they will do things, but I, I think they will, as a younger generation comes in behind, I think these gaming companies actually will start to build out other worlds. You know, they'll look to partner with entertainment companies, which will then create, you know, IP rights holders, right? So then you could see a company like, for example, I make this up, but like Fremantle partnering with, you know, Epic, and suddenly you have a virtual American Idol or, you know, a song competition where you're finding the next great artist, but they're an avatar, right? Like that's, if you start to really start to think about how things might come together, it could look like that. So it could come through strategic partners in a way that we haven't thought about them before. Okay, so we have the social media companies. We have the gaming companies. Where do the traditional tech firms outside of Facebook lie? What do you think about folks like Microsoft or NVIDIA, people who are involved in ships, et cetera? Yeah, um, I think that Microsoft, you should, it's always a good bet to bet on Microsoft. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, they obviously own a specific place in the, in the ecosystem. But the truth is, is we're all on Microsoft systems now, you know, so they, they will take it, they may take a different road in than like our children, right? But, you know, suddenly we'll find ourselves as digital avatars and then we'll suddenly we'll find ourselves collaborating and, you know, a, a technology that allows us to, you know, whiteboard together, but it's all visual and we're digital avatars and, you know, it'll, they will continue to evolve their product offering in a way that we will start to seamlessly be integrated into a metaverse and we will we'll know it's happening and we'll like be like I can't believe this is happening and then suddenly we'll be like wait where's where's you know Foxy Roxy who's our you know who's actually Shannon <laughs> you know I'm making that up that is not my avatar name but you know what I mean it's like the one of those things where you know it, it will start to happen so I would always bet on Microsoft every day of the week, given what Satya has been able to do as well, right? And the smart people that work there and they were my former client as well. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, it's gonna be a race and some of it will come out through business. Some of it will come out through, you know, sort of children and, and even things like ed tech. There are ed tech companies that could be very, very successful in this space, right? Universities and institutions, right? Like how we think about education could be rapidly redefined you know, as all of this stuff starts to really take hold. You bring up a really good point. And Brennan, I'm going to throw this one to you. What is going to be the difference of the, in the metaverse for enterprise? So work, education, healthcare, et cetera, versus the metaverse for entertainment and sort of consumer, you know, time spent? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that it's a great question. As, as Shannon was talking about Microsoft, you know, I think that the, the way that they're going to go in is really focusing on the productivity tools, the enterprise level tools that companies are going to need or want in order to conduct day to day business. Um, I think that from an enterprise standpoint, my guess is that there's going to be a lot more, let's just say guardrails. Um, on, on what is happening in the metaverse, because um, it's, it's meant to be, okay, we're in a meeting room, or there's productivity, here's the whiteboard that we need, virtual whiteboard and whatnot. Um, whereas you look at many of the other, the, the worlds in the metaverse, they're meant to be vast, they're meant to be different, you know, and they're meant to be something that people can explore differently. Um, and, and look, you know, potentially in, in the enterprise level metaverse, you, you're going to you're going to have things that can more easily translate into the real world. So that whatever it is drawing that you did on the whiteboard in the metaverse, then can be spit out 
on onto an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper because you need to actually have that in order to prepare the presentation that has to be physical to the client. So I think there's gonna be a lot more kind of that crossover on the enterprise level of the metaverse um, than, than the, the more social level. I agree. Brendan, we have so many questions coming in from the audience and there's one for you. So I think okay. I'm going to start kicking some of those off. So this one says, how is the metaverse conversation playing in the entertainment world? What does this mean for the more traditional entertainment players in Hollywood? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's super interesting. You know, entertainment world obviously um, has shifted and changed a bunch over the last few years. You know, the way that the way that television was made, television was made, you know, 10 years ago is completely different than the way content is, is made now. Um, I would say from an entertainment standpoint, there's a couple of, of opportunities here. Um, one of them is, you know, just getting people together to view entertainment in the metaverse. So that's getting together with your friends to watch XYZ show. Um, but I also think there's a lot more opportunities for um, celebrities, for uh, PR standpoint to engage with consumers in the metaverse. Um, it used to be that, you know, you needed to show up at a film premiere to really feel like you're in the know. The film premieres always happened in Los Angeles at one or two different theaters. They shut off the street and whatnot. Um, we can be doing film premieres in the metaverse now. And it can be something that anyone from around the world can attend. It, it's democratizing that because it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you have to spend $1,000 to get to Los Angeles and then $500 on your hotel room and then you know, $100 on your one hamburger room service. Um, you can do this from the comfort of your own home, but feel like you're there. So I think that, that from an entertainment standpoint, this is going to be great. It's going to allow people to engage their consumers in a different way. Um, and also to give audiences different things. You know, when you talk about the NFTs that are being created, I think that we're going to start to see that uh, movies, television shows are going to be creating things that potentially go along with the storylines that are happening in the episode arcs. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a brand new world and just a new way for content creators to be connecting more closely with consumers. Okay, so to follow up on that, Shannon, very curious your thoughts here. I love the example about this helps consumers avoid potentially having to travel in person for something or potentially having to do something in person that didn't make sense for them to do. But is there a fear that this would push people to do so much virtually that certain businesses are gonna go out of business? You know, I'm thinking right now about how things like award shows are just tanking because people aren't watching linear TV. Like what businesses are going to be negatively impacted by this transition? I mean, I think it'll be a, it, there will be a build, right? In terms of that happening. I still think that, again, people value in-person experiences, right? Like we all still want to come together and be together. So the fact that like, you know, the Super Bowl, for example, is moving most likely, right? To Texas from Los Angeles. Um, it's because we still want the Super Bowl to happen. You know, like we want these experiences where we can still come together and be together in the real world, right? And I don't think that this is a supplement. I think that's the, that's the interesting part about the metaverse, right? It's meant to be seamless. It's not meant to be all consuming. It's not meant to like replace so many of your real life experience. You're never gonna be like, hey, it's Christmas. Why don't you not bother? We'll all just like get together digitally as avatars in, in my dining room. You know, it's, this is gonna be, I think something that's in addition to, in the way that it is in addition to in the, in the lives of like our kids right now. Um, and, and we will, we will, there will be points in time where that will make sense, right? And, and it will be somewhat common sense. And then there will be times where we're like, you know what, we let's be together. This is, you know, whether it's a big live event or it's a family affair, but you know, obviously we're already seeing businesses that are being impacted, right? The pandemic has like crushed so many businesses, right? And changed the way they operate and changed our behavior pretty radically in a very short amount of time, right? Like think about what's happening, you know, at home grocery delivery, you know, like those are the, I, so, 
I don't really actually know the answer to the question, Sarah, to be totally honest, but I do think it will be, it will not like radically kill out all these businesses because frankly, most businesses won't have a role in the metaverse other than to like show up, use it as a marketing channel, right? They're not going to completely be able to move their businesses into that kind of, you know, environment and be successful, nor do consumers necessarily only want to engage digitally. I have a follow-up question for you, Shannon. This one is one from the audiences. And it's talking about things like NFTs, which we haven't even gotten to yet. <laughs> we have all these different things, DAOs, NFTs, that are part of the metaverse. People aren't really sure about how they are linked. How are you thinking about things like NFTs? Are these things that make it easy for brands to start experimenting? Are they going to be the future? What's your thoughts? I think NFTs are here to stay right? Um, they, you know, it will be a build and you are starting to see brands get into them, whether it's for loyalty, you know, bringing back something old that's new, like Coca-Cola and Budweiser did, right? Marriott just launched three travel, at, you know, NFTs with different artists, but because NFTs, which are non-fungible tokens for those that aren't like, you know, completely like immersing yourself in this world, you know, the, the, they are non-repeatable and they are completely transparent. So what it does is it gives IP rights holders, um, whether you're a sports team, whether you're an artist, whether you're a designer, whether you're, um, you know, an entrepreneur, a way to protect your IP. And then the marketplace determines the value and the worth, right? So um, Gary Vee has, you know, he has V friends, right? He's, al he's always very future forward in, in a lot of these kind of new areas of, of business, right? You know, he, his his greatest asset in what he's doing is his community. So NFTs are really about community. When Clinique did theirs, it was to, you know, make sure they, you know, it was the, the black cherry lipstick that we've all worn at some point in our lives, right? Um, and, you know, the truth is you could get a limited edition ver version of that. You could get a real world version of that. And then you get greater points in your loyalty scheme, right? So, you know, a lot of these brands are using NFTs in different ways, whether it's more of a marketing stunt or and or a way to develop community. Um, and they're giving them away for free rather than monetizing them like Budweiser did as a way in to like test and learn. And now it's being democratized more because you used to only be able to buy NFTs on the blockchain, right? So you had to buy it with Ethereum, which was the, the you know, currency that's used on the blockchain. And so most people's minds are like, I don't even know how to think about that, right? Um, but the truth is now you can buy it with your credit card. So as this stuff gets more democratized in its accessibility, brands will start to do it more. Um, sports teams are using it in a very interesting way. The music industry will use it in a very interesting way. Industries will start to adopt it as a way to connect with people and as a way to support and protect artists' creations. I'm glad that you sort of walk through the logistics of NFTs because that was one of the questions that we had gotten. I'm going to throw this one to Brendan, a similar type of question. How can you describe digital wallets to people who might not have one and are confused about how they work? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I think I think the 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 easiest way to to think about this is a digital wallet is is really just a, a, a digital um, bank box, if you will, a digital um, I'm, I'm missing the word here, but um, digital safe deposit box. There we go. Um, and, and, you know, it's something where everyone can have one. You can really have anything in your digital wallet, whether that's from digital currency to NFTs to skins that you may have purchased. And you need to make sure that you have your personalized key in order to be able to get into your digital wallet. And if you lose that key, that digital wallet is lost forever. And that's that's the key thing. You know, we've we've all seen that. You know, there's folks who have lost their password to get into their account that has 150,000 Bitcoin in it, and that Bitcoin is gone forever unless that person can find can find their wallet. Um, and the wallets, of course, are all linked on on the blockchain, and so um, there's a lot more security around digital wallets because everyone is sitting there saying yes. Like this person is who they say they are, um, and and you know we have validated who they are, and so yes, they can have access to their wallet, which would contain their NFTs, their coins, and and and. Quick follow up for you: 
what are the security risks to having these digital wallets? You know, with my physical wallet, I know what the security risks. Someone can steal my purse. And so I keep that tight on my arm. But mm-hmm. in the digital world, how do you protect your money? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a similar, you know, you have money in a bank account, right? And there's always the potential risk that someone is going to hack your bank. Um, it happens that the bank is then usually backed up by, by the FDIC. And so you have that security there. Absolutely, there's risk in the digital world. And as we're seeing more cyber attacks coming every day, um, there's the possibility that something could happen. But I think that the way that the, the blockchains have been, have been uh, created, there is quite a bit of security um, and it'll be tough um, for, for hackers to, to really do any strong damage. But look, the internet is evolving every day. Hackers are getting better and better and better. So yes, security is something that it could, it could be an issue. I don't think it's something right now that I personally would be, would be particularly worried about. Following up on that, Shannon, we did get a question about trust. What role that brands are going to play in getting consumers to trust that the metaverse is a safe and secure place? What are your thoughts on that? I think brands will play a huge role in that. As long as they're being earnest and genuine about why they're doing it, right? The truth is, is, you know, we, we learn and develop so many of relationships with the world around us through brands every single day. Um, and the brands that do it well will actually greatly benefit from, um, you know, more consumer loyalty, more, you know, more um, retention, et cetera. Um, I think that they, again, I also think like the metaverse is a way to, sh- content is always a way to behave your brand values right? And your role and utility in a person's life with your customer. And so if brands do that well, and it, and it's connected and consistent with the way they show up in the real world, they can have a very pivotal role in, in developing trust with these new platforms and environments that, you know, many of us aren't, you know, haven't spent a lot of time in or familiar with. When it comes to making people more familiar, do you think the advertising world is going to start to become much more metaverse focused. You know, we're seeing this massive ad push around things like sports betting and gaming, but I haven't seen it as big quite yet on the metaverse. What are your thoughts? Um, I think you're seeing a lot of it in PR, right? Like, I think there's a lot of like um, event hyping PR headlines as people try to figure out how, what does the metaverse mean for them? You know, does that look like I'm participating and doing a Roblox game? Um, does it look like I'm building my own land? Does it look like I'm doing, you know, three NFTs with famous artists and dropping them in Art Basel? Like, what does it, what, you know, how, how does that look? And then the more momentum that that gets, the more curiosity it provokes. So I think what we're seeing just as an industry is there's a lot of provocation around like, what is it? How do I use it? Lots of question marks, which is why we're doing this panel today, right? Which is to, to better you know, educate so we can start to have different conversations, both with our clients, but also together about how do we, how do we become a leader in this space, which is not going away, right? And how do we help onboard our clients in a, you know, in any way they need to be, whether they want to go sprint right out of the gate or they want to just crawl into it and try something new and different. If I could, if I could add on to to what Shan said, I, I completely agree that that right now it is it is very much the PR, the stunty element of it that that the brands are looking for. You know, I, I come from a creative agency, um, and so you know we're the ones sitting there doing a lot of the advertising and the content creation and whatnot for these brands. And I think that you know what we're going to start to see is that in addition to us saying, oh, you should make this beautiful short film and then we'll do you know, static assets and social extensions and whatnot, we're gonna start to see, okay, what is the extension of this in the metaverse? Like, is there an NFT extension that happens here? And so when we talk about a 360 marketing campaign, what's gonna happen is part of that 360 is the metaverse activation as well. But if, if you're a good marketer out there, you want all of those things, with all of your marketing and communications operating on you know, the same cylinders, firing on the same cylinders. And so it all needs to be linked and all needs to be driving back to the same, the same general goal of, of the brand. 
Okay, so one of the really interesting questions that we got here, which I think is super smart, is to your point about figuring out how they're linked, I think a lot of brands are trying to figure out what is the size of the audience in the metaverse and how fast is that audience going to grow? I want to get your thoughts, Brendan, first. What is the current size of the metaverse for people that are interested in these types of technologies? And how big does it grow? Do we think eventually every single person on earth, all 6 billion, are going to be metaverse members? Or do you think that it's going to be confined to a small group of people with access to strong broadband, et cetera? Well, um, I, I let me answer that kind of in, in backwards order. Um, I don't think that everyone on earth is going to become part of the metaverse um, in, in the near future. I'm, I'm still just happy that my grandmother is on Zoom. Um, she's 97 years old, so that was a feat uh, just to get that done. Um, so I don't think that everyone's going to become part of the metaverse. Um, I think at the moment it's it's small. Um, I don't know that I don't know the number at the moment. I can't give you an actual number. Um, but I think that as as it starts to grow, as there's more brands that are pushing to get into this space, as there's more opportunity, um, you're going to start to see more and more people that are going to dabble. And I think that the difference that we're going to that we're going to see is the people that are dabbling just from a social standpoint, I want to be where my friends are. I'm I have a metaverse something account, if you will. And so I've, I've you know, in there a couple of times once in a while versus the hardcore users. Um, and I think that that's that's probably going to be I think you're going to have kind of a, a 50 50 split there. Um, but again, I don't have numbers right now. Maybe Shannon does. Um, so it looks like she does. So I will let Shannon tell us what the numbers are. Thanks, Brendan. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, I, I have some numbers, right? So just like, you know, you think about Roblox, right? They have about 47.3 daily average daily users. Um, which is a pretty significant number. You have about 300 million people playing Fortnite chapter three, which is the latest chapter. But when you think about an event like the Galactus event that happened, which was a partnership with Marvel and the entertainment question, right? Which is, you know, Marvel and, and Fortnite did a big collaboration last year and 15.3 million people showed up at the same time to play the game. I was one of them. <laughs> wow. um, you know, concurrently, which is huge, right? And there were still people that couldn't get on the platform because there were so many people that wanted to play that game. And Travis Scott, right? He had, you know, millions and millions of people come to his concert and performance inside of Fortnite. So I think, you know, when you start to put those numbers, even, you know, and, and, and this is where we benefit from a broader um, umbrella of how we define the metaverse, right? Because what I'm talking about doesn't account for NFTs, right? It doesn't account for all the people that are experiment, you know, with blockchain and, and open C and like all that stuff. Um, it doesn't, it, it should account for all the folks that are logging into Snap every day and using AR technology or lenses on Instagram, on Facebook, or, you know, like all of, you know, all of these things sort of, this is where brands start to look into how they trial and how they engage and how they um, experience experiment with our customers differently, right? The ability to try on my glasses inside of a snap lens with Zenny is very beneficial to me because my face is weird shape and like certain glasses don't look good on me. Um, but I buy my glasses through Zenny. So that's like a very useful tool. And technically it sort of sits inside this metaverse umbrella. So, you know, I think that if you, if you add all those numbers together in some way, shape or form, we are all playing in the meta, you know, many of us are playing in the metaverse, whether we're doing it as part of our daily interactions or we're doing it in a more directional way, which is, you know, for me, my kids drag me into the metaverse and I'm like sitting there watching, you know, how am I searching for this little glow in the dark purse, you know, or whatever. Okay, so we are in the final moments of this conversation and I wanna take it a really high level and just sort of get your thoughts philosophically on some of the things we just discussed. One of the big questions about the metaverse from a public policy perspective that I hear all the time in DC is whether or not this actually drives inequality or it levels the playing field for people. You know, there's a question of, is this ready player one where people with you know, low household income are relying on doing everything digitally, vacation, socialization, because they can't afford to do it in the real world? 
or does this become a thing where it's the great equalizer and people have more access to jobs and opportunity? You can kind of see it going both ways, right? Even right now, travel is so expensive. Renting a car is more expensive than it ever has been because of supply chain issues. Does that mean more people are going to explore virtual activities? Um, I'll start with you, Brendan, and then we'll give it off to Shannon. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I think it's a I think it's a really important question. And I think it's something that you know we're all going to have to to think about and look at as as we go forward. Um, you know, the the optimistic side of me wants to sit there and say this is a great equalizer and this is something that will allow um, perhaps people who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to see the Grand Canyon through the metaverse or something like that. Um, so I think that when you when you talk about that sense, this could be the great equalizer. But I also think we have to look at the fact that there were there were millions of kids in this country who didn't have a computer or an iPad at home in order to actually uh, study from home and study virtually when when we all went into lockdown. And same number of people who didn't have access to internet at their homes. And so I think that that's something where again brands, the people that are creating the metaverse, the people that, that we are using their airwaves and their, their digital access are going to have to sit there and say, hey, we want to make this something that is available to everyone so that people can have it. And it's the same situation where, you know, a computer that's 15 years old that might work perfectly well to type a Word document on may not have the ability to, to handle the metaverse. Um, so I think that the, the, the inequality that we're all experiencing right now is, is, is going to be the same uh, with the, the beginnings of the metaverse, but I'd like to hope that, again, brands can help lead the way to allow people access um, to make this something that could uh, be a great equalizer. Shannon, I'm going to throw this to you. So Brendan just talked about the role of brands. What role does society play, whether that's government, nonprofits, people who advocate for consumers from a policy perspective? I mean, I think that, you know, that's it's a big question. Um, I do think that, you know, this is sort of where we talked about responsibility. So if we're saying that, for example, Meta will be the first into, you know, to probably start to really own and take a leadership position in the metaverse. Um, they have a responsibility to help people better access, you know, things like the internet. And, you know, I think also 5G coming along will also help a lot. And as cities themselves get more wired and, and things like that, there will be things that help that process. But I, I, I think that there also has to be a reason, right? Like, I, I don't know that like being able to, you know, go on a virtual trip is, is the reason. I think better access to education is a huge opportunity and reason, right? Like if I can't go to college because I can't afford, you know, I can't get a loan because there's a bunch of stuff going on and I can't, you know, afford to live and have living expenses. Well, what if I had a metaverse where I could go to university every day and still interact with people and not have it be a Zoom, you know? So I think that if, I think it's about the, what is the purpose, right? And then, and then how do advocates in society get behind that purpose? to create more accessibility for people. And, and that, you know, I do think has a responsibility when it comes to the, you know, wireless providers. If they want to participate, Verizon and AT&T want to roll out 5G and it starts to get shut down by the FAA, right? Because it's going to start to interfere with, you know, planes, <laughs> you know, like, and, but they also want people to come online so that you can then be in the metaverse, right? Then you have a responsibility to provide those services and make them accessible for all. So, so that's how I feel. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. I think it's this really tough balancing act and we're not gonna know the answer to it. It's gonna happen incrementally across so many different industries. Okay. When I think about this from a 10,000 foot view, it seems like this conversation around the metaverse and digital thinking, digital living, it really has been expedited in the past two years throughout the pandemic. You know, I'm sitting here from CES and as I said at the beginning, like there's very few people here because it's still raging on. So my question is, let's start with Brendan. What impact did COVID have on bringing us to this point where we're now really thinking seriously about a virtual world through the metaverse? Oh, I, th I think it was, 
I think it was huge in, in accelerating. Um, I think that, you know, it, it, this would have come anyway if, if COVID hadn't happened, but I think that it, it made it so that everyone was much more comfortable living a, a digital, digital life, if you will, um, and pushed technology companies to start to develop technology that allows us to do this. Um, you know, I can think of panels at the beginning of the pandemic that were much more disorganized than this one was. Um, but, um, you know, so we're seeing technology changing every day in order to make people's lives easier and allow us to live a, a, a more digital world. So I think that COVID absolutely impacted this and just accelerated everything. But I don't think it's the reason that this is happening because I think it would have happened anyway. Shin, do you agree? And if so, what would have been the timeline if it weren't for COVID? Um, I completely agree. Um, I do think that it would have, I think we would probably be a couple of years out from where we are now, to be honest. I think that the coming, you know, again, as the catalyst, right, the coming together of people being forced into digital communications as a part of our daily like working, playing, friend, social circles, right? Like how many Zoom happy hours did you have at the beginning of the, you know, when did you ever do that? Never, mm -hmm. right? Um, and when do you ever want to do it again? Never. But like that, but at the end of the day, right? Like our kids, that's how they communicated with their friends. After Zoom school, they would go and like log into whatever metaverse they were playing in and they then they would have social time. So in the past, they would have been overscheduled, right? They would have been playing basketball or tennis or soccer, or doing homework club or taking Chinese or like whatever they're doing, right? To like, you know, learn and grow and play piano and play guitar. Like the children of today live a much different life than we did growing up. So they had so many activities and then all of a sudden all their activities went away and they went into one little space that is a giant metaverse. And I think so that- it's such a different, it's a, it totally changed the timeline. So, okay, the last and final question, because we just have to wrap up here. I'm going to ask both of you, you know, Shannon, you seem to discuss a lot about how this is impacting kids. Brendan, you discuss a lot about how this is impacting Hollywood. As consumers, what's the one way where the metaverse has impacted you? Shannon, you start. I think it's had a very personal impact, quite frankly. I mean, in, in an interesting way, right? Professionally and personally, because I have learned so much about the metaverse. Just, you know, when I, I remember the first time my daughter played Roblox and I was like, what is this? And what are you doing? It looks so rudimentary, right? When you're used to like Pixar and like the experiences that you had before that were these kind of surround sound immersive experiences. And that what, what is immersive to them is being in this three dimensional environment where they can go anywhere and they can go up on the ceiling and they can go to the left. And when they look, they look, right? It's, and then they're playing with their friends. And so for me personally, it's come with benefits, which is it allowed for my children to have community and something to do and, and be happy during a time that was very challenging, right? It allowed for, um, me to better understand professionally where the world is going, right? I've always, you know, I used to work for Mark Burnett. Mark Burnett used to develop all of our properties based on what his kids were doing. So he was like, he would sit in meetings with the heads of all these companies and be like, one day your child will just walk up to the television, the big screen, not even a TV, and they will move around whatever they want to watch, right? So it, it's kind of like that. Like I look at how YouTube democratized and changed the way that studios have to put out content, right? And so for me personally, it was very educational. And then I will say also personally, very difficult because it has changed the relationship dynamic in my home where I'm constantly either trying to take it away as a way to <laughs> say like your homework's more important. You cannot do that, right? Or, you know, policing their, their time, but also knowing it is the way that they connect and behave in a way that I don't understand because that yeah. isn't how I was raised. So it's been a very interesting experience. I can imagine. Um, Brendan, give me your final thoughts on how it's impacted you. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I think it's, it's, it's been slightly terrifying in some ways. It's like, wow, like this is completely new. Like this is really different. This isn't 
is this the real world? Like, is this what the world is becoming? Um, but I do think just from a, from a personal standpoint, like the ability to do things with friends, uh, to attend things with other people and get to meet them while I was sitting at home during the pandemic, um, and actually feel like I have some sense of place and some control over what's happening. Like that was really important over the last two years. Um, otherwise, you know, it would have just been Zoom things or I would be reading about something on Twitter or reading a news article or whatnot. So I think that that, that slightly higher level digital interaction with friends and people beyond just a phone conversation or a text or a group chat or a Zoom um, was really interesting and, and frankly for me made made the pandemic slightly better than than it could have been. Super interesting. I mean, I think I feel both ways. I feel both freaked out and grateful by all of the changes, but I think if I had to share the one way where the metaverse has changed the way that I'm thinking about the world, it's definitely that, you know, I always read Ready Player One as being, I'm not sure if you've seen the movie or book, uh, so far away. And I think what the conversation right now around the pandemic and the metaverse has done is it's helped me realize like it's now, it's not that far away. Uh, Brendan and Shannon, thank you so much for participating in this conversation. I know I learned a lot, um, specifically the things that really caught my attention when trying to figure out how do we fig you know, measure the metaverse, Shannon, some of the stats you offered, how many people are on Roblox, how many people are attending concerts was really helpful. And then Brendan, I think what you were just saying, you know, earlier on about how you don't have to go to an in-person movie premiere anymore, and that can democratize Hollywood in some ways, was really interesting. I want to thank everyone at Stagwell for making this possible, and thank you so much to everyone who tuned in and asked questions. We had so many great questions. Um, if you ever need anything, my email is just sarah at axios.com, and I look forward to convening with you again in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.